Okay, um, just for a brief off-time roadmap, I'm just going to go into framing and definitions, and then into our policy, and then a case. And with that, is anybody not ready? All right, I'll take that as a no then. And then my time is going to start now. My partner and I stand on the firmest affirmation of the resolution today that the U.S. federal government should repeal the law stating that if the majority of workers in a bargaining union vote for a union, then that union becomes the exclusive representative for all the workers in that bargaining union. With that, let's go into some definitions. So my partner and I define a bargaining unit as bargaining unit as the group of employees to whom a labor union negotiates a collective bargaining agreement for. We define exclusive representation as the right of a union by a majority of employees in a plant, craft, industry, store, etc., to represent all employees in the union, regardless of whether or not the members they are members of the union or not. For today's weighing mechanism, we're going to go with net benefit just to see which world has the most benefit. And we're defining today's round as a policy round as it is calling on an actor to have an action and pass a policy or re thus repeal one. So with that, let's go into the affirmation of the government's policy today. So the actor is going to be the United States federal government. Our time frame will be passed immediately, but phased in through the end of the 2022, 2022 fiscal year. And our funding comes from normal means and ways. Our plan is as follows. The United States federal government will amend the National Labor Relations Act to repeal the law that establishes exclusive representation. And with that, let's go into our two contentions. Contention one is about misrepresentation. Subcontention A is about the utilitarian principle. So essentially under exclusive representation, it grants unions a monopoly status to negotiate on the behalf of all members and employees of a working union, of a company, of an industry, so on and so forth. Whether or not a person is a member of that union, if this exclusive representation has been voted by a majority of union members, then they are thus represented by that person. So it takes a utilitarian approach saying that we're going to just have one representation voice for the majority of people, thus ignoring the idea, like the ideas and the voices and the, those that come from the minority people, whether or not they're in that union or not. So if you're in the minority of a group that did not vote for this representation, you're entirely powerless because the union is the exclusive voice that comes to negotiating things. And negotiations come down to things such as bathroom breaks, wage hours, working at wages, working hours, how long shifts will be set, all especially critical things that come to like the quality of a workspace. But if you're in the minority, then you're exclusively ignored. So for example, if there were a vote where 48 against this uh, representation, but 52% for it, well, too bad, too sad for the 48% in the minority because, well, they're the minority and it takes a utilitarian approach, thus not really allowing everyone to be equally represented and have their voices equally heard, thus hindering and negatively, negatively affecting their working conditions. Uh, as, additionally, in these times, magazines goes on to describe that because of this utilitarian approach, Union officials are basically de-incentivized to do the best job they can because all they have to do is maintain power till the next union election. As long as they can appease and like uh, make sure that the majority of people are happy, they can do that. Thus, they don't really have to listen to everyone else in the minority. So they're, they're just incentivized to appease only the majority, whether how big or small the majority margin may be. Subcontention B is about a lack of options. USA Today in September of 2018 goes on to describe that workers who choose to not be a union can't negotiate anything. They're hindered optionless. Because of this utilitarian approach as we describe in, in contention 1A, essentially they have no options and they're forced to listen to what happens. So imagine if you yourself had to agree to the negotiations that another union set up for you while well, you yourself don't want to confine and conform to what that union has set well too bad for you and you're in that position with a lack of options so you either have to leave the work because the conditions are so bad altogether and you don't like the negotiations or you have to con conform to what the majority has established for you which oftentimes can be something not favorable to individual circumstances once again we're talking about things such as like essential things like bathroom breaks, working hours, and how long those shifts are established to be, all critical things that really cannot be catered toward just the majority. It differs person to person, and every individual should have the right to have this voice. So in the affirmation world, when this is repealed, we're fixing these problems when minority voices are not listened to, but in the negation world, and in the world in which this a law has is not repealed, we're really just seeing a standard set 
However, we don't live in a black and white world. We have gray areas where people have to have their individual negotiations and circumstances set to them. Contention two is about progress. So George Satsky of the UPenn Law Review, volume one, uh, 123,897, describes that essentially under the Taft-Harley Act, which is also known as the National Labor Relations Act, um, essentially what happened was that is that the National Relations Board for different labor unions uh, works for works for places in places without unions too. So even if an area doesn't have a union, that's going to be representing the workers in that area. So you can turn to like Amazon and Alabama where they weren't unionized. However, they were still being represented by a different like voting union and exclusive representation because of this act altogether. So even these people who didn't want to be in this union were being represented by some other exclusive representation voice, another negotiating voice, meaning that this can't happen. However, George Shatsky then goes on to explain in this law review saying that this is essentially just a case of basic appeasement for even these people that were the majority of people aren't in labor unions because of like how different systems work at companies like Amazon. What happens is these exclusive representations, these exclusive representatives only have to appease, have like basic appeasement and they really don't listen to individual voices. Therefore, it hinders progress because they only have to listen to what like the monopoly utilitarian power wants to have. And George Shatsky goes on to explain that in recent decades, we really haven't seen a lot of progress when it comes to working rights and like the conditions in which people work in, especially in factories or fulfillment centers like those that belong to companies such as Amazon, because of this exclusive representation that the workers there have zero power to negotiate. So if the working shifts are 12 hours long, well, too bad for you. You don't have a voice to talk to your employer and try to negotiate this, even if you're not part of and supporting of the exclusive representation. If you have a condition in which you have to use the bathroom frequently, too bad for you because if the exclusive representative has set it up that you can only have bathroom breaks ever, like every X amount of hours, well then that is what you have to conform to. And that's why we haven't seen a lot of progress when it comes to working rights for individuals workers, especially in areas such as factories and fulfillment centers, which are only growing with the ever growing industries such as Amazon in the online shopping space, which just have been creating a lot more fulfillment jobs and all these people there are really losing their rights and they don't have an option towards progress. So because of these reasons, you affirm, thank you. All right, um, is everyone ready for the op speech? So just a quick opt-in roadmap. This is gonna go our op advantages, then it's gonna to go to the Gov's case. Is everyone good? Cool. With that being said, my time, wait, just really quickly, if you guys have a POI, uh, feel free to interrupt me because I'm gonna be looking off like another documents. So I will be able to see if you raise your hand on the screen per se. So just feel free to give any verbal interruptions. Cool. With that being said, our time starts now. So really quickly off the framework and like plans, do we agree with all the definitions, plans, and framework? Um, we'll just get really quickly back to our op case. So we have our sole contention, which is essentially union gains. In the status quo, if a union exists for a company, it is the exclusive representation for all types that fall under union rule whether or not workers want to be the union or not. In an act world, repealing this exclusive representation act would make it so that there will be multiple unions, even if more than 50% of the workers want to operate under one specific union. Unfortunately, the premise of numerous unions within the workforce hinders gains for workers' rights and benefits in three different ways. The first is through converging precedents. Let's say there's two unions, Union A and Union B. Union A holds 99% of the workers' affiliation, meaning 99% of a specific type of worker likes Union A. But then Union B only holds 1% of workers' affiliation. Let's say Union A wants to raise their hourly rate by $10 because they're going through excruciating conditions in which they have to pee through cops and they, they don't get any time off to see their families on the weekend. But Union B wants to keep this hourly rate and keep all these suffering conditions that they're going through right now. If Union B, Union B then proceeds to talk with the company to keep and secure these hourly rates the same rate as it been for the last five years. This is really bad for Union A, for Union A members, because it's now then impossible for Union A members to receive their wants because of a, of a higher hourly rate, because a precedent has already been established by Union B. 
That means the 1% of workers dictates 99% of the workers in a negative way. This is all illegal in the status quo in the off world. This is the reason why this act is in place to keep companies from having moles in their workers and to work, fight against workers' rights. Essentially, what we're saying is that in an act world, both unions hold the same weight, even if there's a vast decrease amount of workers. So one is more vast support of people and one is less vast support of people. As such, a vote for the AFVAT side is essentially a vote against the basic principles of democracy and a vote against workers' interests. And the second way about how you diminish uh, workers' rights is through diminishing bargaining power. Without exclusive representation or an election, each employee designates the union of his or own, her own choice or designates no union at all. Each union or individual then negotiates with the employer. Of course, under the AF world, each union does not have the allegiance of any employers other than those it represents. This bears one stark implication. The economic pressure a union can bring to bear is limited to the impact those employees can create by their strike or threat of striking. Where essentially what we're saying is, is that sure, there might be more unions in their world, but the fact of the matter is, is that because there are more unions, they lack the collective bargaining power that they can actually establish for a clear and concise race. The inefficiencies of having so many different unions and having so many different negotiations drastically de decreases the, the, effective, the efficiency and the effectivity of these union bargains. Because essentially, if you have one person of workers trying to bargain for one specific right, the company isn't going to care because that's literally only 1% of their workforce. Whereas in our world, if you have the majority of workers who want to bargain for one specific right, that's going to work because that means all workers are threatening not to, not to work anymore and they're threatening to leave the, uh, the site at premise. That means overall, the bargain power is going to come on our side. This essentially is a prerequisite to all the arguments that they outline. Because at the end of the day, all the arguments that they outline is concerning the fact that these smaller unions, these more representative unions, have bargaining power. But the problem is they don't. You can't get anything done if you don't have bargaining power. And the only way you have bargaining power is by having the majority of people at the helm and being the exclusive rights of negotiating with the company because that's the only way you're going to pressure the company to give into the rights or else all workers will strike and fail to work. But the third way is also through efficiency. It's simple logic, right? It's the reason why the U.S. policymaking system exists and why it's different from the parliament system. Back in Europe, there's a lot of parliament systems over there. The problem is it's really inefficient and bills take a long time to get passed. Whereas in the you United States, is, sure, go ahead. In what way does the AF plan guarantee that more unions are going to be created or even create the opportunity for more unions to be created? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, in what way does the AF plan guarantee or create the opportunity for more different unions to be created within the same industry? Yeah, we're not saying... Yeah, so the, what the app plan essentially is doing is essentially is make, getting rid of exclusive rights. Because you get rid of exclusive rights, that means you can have multiple unions in a specific industry. Meaning if 1% of the employees want a specific union over another union that 99% of employees want, they're allowed to do that. But in the net world, that is fundamentally illegal. But the promise of that is, is that you're essentially... One, you're leading to diverging precedents, but two, you're restricting the bargaining power of more people by having more and conflicting unions. But three, there's general more inefficiency in your world because of the fact that there's multiple unions trying to negotiate for the same thing at the end of the day. With that being said, let's go down their case really quickly. On the first contention about misrepresentation of the minority, there are a couple of problems off the bat. First, they never contextualize any instances or warrant why utilitarianism is bad in terms of working conditions. The majority would like better working conditions. It's simply a logical statement. What they're essentially doing is that and the only way for minority rights to be corrected in an app world is to create more unions in the app world. But we tell you that more unions is inherently really, really bad because the fact that they lack collective bargaining power as we see, that's why right now we see the reason why this bill has lasted for as many years as it has is because this is an on net, a net beneficial bill. It's why you've seen so many unions exist in so many factories today and why they're able to actually get the collective bargaining rights that they talk about. 
But all the problems they talk about, like big tech, about Amazon, Google, not giving proper union rights and not giving proper bargaining powers is because in a lot of those companies, unions don't even exist. The reason why unions exist is irrelevant of this resolution. In no way do they actually link into the existence of unions in terms of affirming the resolution. Because in their world, they're not actually increasing the they're not in, actually increasing the presence of unions. They're simply increasing the, the numbers of unions. They're simply boosting from one union to multiple unions, not the ban of unions altogether. That means overall, it's a vote for us in the right direction because we're the only ones who can maintain bargaining power for all workers involved in the company. For these reasons, we're a really strong opt out. Thank you. Alrighty. Um, can everybody hear me okay? It's like Wi-Fi and whatnot good? Awesome. So in that case, hi everyone. My name is Connor Eubank. I'll be the second speaker for the affirmative. I'm from Crescent Valley and my pronouns are he, they. Uh, with that said, for a brief off-time roadmap, we're going to be looking at framework, uh, the plan, and then going over the neg case and then the AF case. Um, also for POIs, you guys can feel free to unmute as well. Awesome. So with that said, my time will begin now, my partner and I continue to affirm the resolution that the US federal government should repeal the law stating that if the majority of workers in a bargaining unit vote for a union, then that union becomes the exclusive representative for all workers in that bargaining unit. First, let's look at framework. So the negation conceded to our framework, so that means that the definitions we provided are going to stand for today's round. But we need to look at one crucial definition in today's round, and that's what exclusive representation is, right? So my partner provided the definition, which is that uh, the right of a union chosen by the majority of employees in a plant craft industry or department of a shop or business to represent all the employees in that unit, regardless of whether or not they're members of the union. So basically what this means is it says whether or not you're members of this union, whether or not you voted for this union representative, they will represent you until the next election cycle happens. And the problem with this, the problem that the negation kind of misconstrues this definition, is that by getting rid of exclusive representation, they say we're opening the door for multiple unions to be created, when that's not actually the case. What we're actually doing is saying you do not have to be represented by the union. You can be represented by the union, but if you want, you can choose to represent yourself when going to your business, when going to the company, or when going to whoever your employer is and basically appealing for better working conditions. So Ooh, basically, I... uh, yeah. Um, if a person or an individual doesn't have the numbers, what incentive does a company have to actually abide by the minority rights that you guys claim that you're going to be protecting with someone being represented as an individual? Yeah, absolutely. So basically what we're saying is in the affirmation world, we're trying to repeal this because we want uh, people to have the ability to represent themselves if they so choose, right? In the negation world, which is the status quo, you don't have that option. You either be represented by the union or you're not represented at all. So basically we're opening this doorway. Is it perfect? Or is everyone going to be 100% satisfied? Probably not. There's no perfect solution to anything. But what we're saying is we want these people to have the option to be represented because they don't have that in the status quo. So basically looking at what the negation does is they basically say if we get rid of uh, exclusive representation, we're just opening the door to millions of unions being created when that's not the case. Once again, you can't just uh, create unions willy-nilly. Instead, what we're actually doing is saying, hey, if you want representation, if you want to go yourself directly to your employer, the company, your business, and say, I want better conditions, I want better rights, or I'm going to sue you, um, you're able to do that. You can do that in the status quo right now. If you want to sue your business, you have to do it through the union. And so with that said, we're going to go over to the negations case. So they have one sole, uh, sole contention. We're just going to go down that. So their contention is that there are going to be multiple unions being created and that this is bad. A union exists to represent all people and that creating multiple unions is going to just mess this up. Once again, multiple unions aren't being created. Their entire contention is just uh, like incapacitated because it relies on a faulty premise. But we're still going to go through and say why each of these things, A, aren't happening and B, is just not really a good idea or isn't really a valid point anyways. So on their 1A, they basically say precedents are going to conflict. So they say that two unions are going to fight and that the uh, business or company or whoever the employer is, is always going to be listening to this minority. That 1% who wants bad conditions, the, empl uh, the employer is going to continue to listen to that and that this will harm workers' rights. But for a few reasons, this isn't really true. Once again, multiple unions aren't going to be existing. That's not true. So their 1A just exists on a faulty premise. But secondly, what we can see is that in the status quo right now, the people who want to fight for more progressive workers' rights are actually still the minority in many of these unions. And we're going to bring some more examples on the AF case, but perfect examples would be, for example, paid family leave or maternity leave, increasing higher wages or making better working hours. So all of these are great examples of how if you are uh, misrepresented by your union, you don't really have an option. So for example, if you work at an Amazon factory and there is just no union for Amazon factory workers, you can't represent yourself. You can't sue Amazon and say, hey, my working hours are atrocious. I don't like this. You don't have that option. 
So basically what we're saying is in the affirmation world, we give you that ability to do that. In the negation world, they basically say, no, if, if you don't comply with the majority, if you don't do what the status quo is right now, you don't get an option. You don't get a second choice. So their entire premise is just that like people want bad working conditions and that that's what's going to happen when that's happening in the status quo and that is the negations world. Secondly, they bring up in their 1B how to re we're diminishing bargaining power because unions gain their power and strikes gain their power from economic pressures of multiple workers like working together and banding together. And what we can see is basically their premise is that all these different unions that are going to be created are going to fracture this power and we're not going to have really any cohesive movements. Once again, multiple unions aren't being created, so their 1B also falls flat. But what we can see is furthermore, right now in the status quo, we're not just talking about strikes, right? Like the goal of this round and the goal of this resolution is to talk about workers' rights as a whole. And the best way to get workers' rights is to have an ability to be represented. If the majority of people want to strike, the majority of people have the ability to strike in the affirmation world. However, what we can see is if you are in the minority, if you are someone who says, hey, I don't like these working conditions, but the majority of people don't agree. They're fine with what's happening right now. You don't have an option. You don't have the ability to protest or give or ask for better rights. And so basically what we're doing is we're giving those people that option in the AF world. The negation says, if you're in that minority, oh bad, like, oh well, too bad, you don't get an option. And their 1C is on efficiency. They talk about parliament versus the US government. This isn't really topical. We're not trying to move to a parliamentary system. We're not trying to move to a system with multiple unions. Their 1C is just non-topical. With that said, we're going to go over to the AF case. So on the AF case, we give you a plan and we're saying we're amending the NLRA to repeal the law that establishes exclusive representation, therefore allowing workers to represent themselves. So what we can see is in the plan text, we never say that multiple unions are going to be created. We never say we're changing the law that says like only one union can exist for a given industry or for a given company. What instead we're saying is that you have the ability to sue on your own behalf. You have the ability to protest or go to your employer on your own behalf. And so with that, we're going to go over to our first contention, which is misrepresentation. They basically say that we never give a reason why utilitarianism is bad. Well, we're going to give a couple examples. We're going to continue to like circle back to these throughout the rest of the case. So first of all, we can see that historically in the United States, racism and to this day, racism is a huge problem. And so for a really long time, a lot of union members were incredibly racist. And obviously racist union members well, still exist to this day. Yep. Is it utilitarianism the value that we should be viewed for this debate? No, utilitarianism is not the value we should be viewing. Uh, but well, that's should... net benefits, right? Uh, yeah, we provided the criterion of net benefits, which is just kind of weighing benefits versus consequences. So basically what that says, is we're trying to make it the best world for everybody, right? So if you're in the minority, um, under utilitarianism, your views are null and void, essentially. If you're in the minority of 5%, 10%, 40%, and you don't agree with the majority, oh, well, it does not matter what happens to you because it has absolutely no bearing on utilitarianism. Net benefit says we want to help everybody, right? So if you are in the minority, you still have a voice. You still deserve to be heard and represented. So basically what we're talking about here with utilitarianism, for a long time, unions were racist and were exclusionary of or didn't listen to the voices of bio-POC individuals who worked in those industries. And for a long time, racist practices continued in unions. And this is because those individuals didn't have the ability to stand up for themselves on the legal sphere. Essentially, they weren't given a voice, they weren't given power because of this exclusive representation. Utilitarianism is bad because if you're in the minority, you don't have a voice. And this is something the negation wants to perpetuate. But secondly, on our lack of options, we tell you that if you're either A, not in a union, or B, if you are in the minority of people who voted for a different like union representative, you can't negotiate on your own behalf. If you're unhappy with your paid family leave, if you're unhappy with your wages or your working hours or your bathroom breaks or whatever it is, you cannot negotiate. You can't go to your employer and say, I demand like better conditions. You can't sue your employer and say, I demand better conditions because you are represented by the union and the union represents you 100%. We, we want to change that essentially. We're saying if you want to sue, if you don't agree with what the union is doing, you should still have a voice. You shouldn't just have to go along with whatever people are telling you to do. On our second contention on progress, we cite George Shotsky from UPenn basically say the NRL LB basically says that for people who don't have a union, they don't have negotiating power, but they're still going to be represented by a union. By a union. And this leads to basic appeasement. The union is only going to do what benefits the majority. If you're in the minority, if you say, I need these different conditions, I have a medical condition that needs more attention, or I need better wages to help support my family or whatever, you're not going to be paid attention to because your voice doesn't matter. In a utilitarian vote, all that matters is the majority, and that's why the majority is the only one being heard on the negations world and in the status quo. And so for these reasons, you affirm. Thank you. Cool. Um, let me just pull up my timer really fast. I believe I have eight minutes. Is that correct? Okay, solid. Um, okay, quick off-time roadmap. I'm just going to go down my opponent's responses 
and then I'm going to go back on our case with weighing as I go. All right, solid. Time starting now. On the very top, my opponents try to explain that our arguments don't fall under the definition, but that's fundamentally not true. They're painting a false reality here. First, let's look to exclusive representation. Just because it exists doesn't mean you can't sue on your own behalf. You can drop my opponent's response here because individuals not being represented isn't the issue here. It's the fact of whether or not exclusive representation is what's going to limit them from being able to pursue their own rights. At the end of the day, that's just a blatant misrepresentation of reality. You can drop them here. Next, my opponents misconstrue our argument. Our argument isn't that there's going to be multiple unions, but there's going to be multiple bargainers for the company instead of one cohesive group. This inherently is going to lead to conflicts of interest on basic logic, as parliamentary debate should be also evaluated on. The very fact of the matter is, all the studies that my opponents are citing literally are zero warrant. They have zero warrants behind them. You can drop all, each and every single piece of evidence. But when you look to our case, you can look to the very fact that on face value, on logic, you have to realize that what happens here is that unions or even yeah. bargainers, I'll take it as soon as I finish this point, multiple bargainers lead to more inefficiency, which at the end of the day is what's going to slow down getting the interests of even one majority. Okay, I'll take your POI. Did you guys concede to the affirmation's definition of exclusive representation? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, next, their framework of net benefits is literally utilitarianism, maximizing the most benefits for the most amount of people. You can literally, my opponent's case like contradicts themselves. It's literally what we're doing in the status quo, the most good for the most people. And that's going along with the idea that the majority of the union is going to be represented. That is utilitarianism on face value. If that's the weighing mechanism used for the round, you can draw my opponents every single time. That means that all of our arguments Arguments apply to bargainers, unions, and individual workers, work groups of workers, and etc. And this also means that all of our implications and prerequisites go cold conceded. Employee precedents are literally used in the status quo. They look to the lowest salary paid and cross apply to every single worker. The number that that's like the first big deal here. Second is that you can't get any rights if you don't have bargaining power. This prerequisites any and all of their arguments, and it goes cold conceded in my opponent's speech. Affirming reduces bargaining power for the and de for the main union and decreases working rights for the majority. Judge, their own framework is the most benefit for the most people, and that goes away in the AF world because you're limiting the bargaining power of the organization that represents the majority of the people in a working given union. Anyway. Now, I'll take it at the end of my point. You have to realize why opponent concedes, and this is key and integral to the entire round. Each response they give is predicated on whether or not more bargaining agents will exist or be formed in an AF world. They cold concede the warrant in Krishna's speech that says, by the only way, the only way for minority rights to be protected in an AF world is to create more bargaining agents in that world. This is because there is strength in numbers. A company is likely not going to listen to an individual or even a few people. You need numbers to back up because that allows you to strike and have more leverage against the company. As such, more bargaining agents are going to be created. And that's the only solution to to protecting minority rights. As such, you'll realize that we aren't arguing that minority rights are going to be protected more in our world. The reality is that minority rights won't be protected in either world. It's non-unique. In the opposition world, at least policy and representation gets passed. And that's what this round's coming down to. The very fact of the matter is, in the AF world, inefficiencies through multiple bargaining agents will ensure that no policy is really going to be passed because at the end of the day, each bargaining agent will hold significant or equal weight to each other, which at the end of the day is inherently undemocratic, but also goes against representing the majority, which is all against the framework of utilitarianism. At the end of the day, the comparison that Krishna provides about the parliamentary system versus the US government system is super key because it shows that in a parliamentary system, the people of the government, there are multiple different parties. At the end of the day, that is what leads to their structural inefficiencies. Whereas if you look to the United Government the United States, we have fewer parties, but we have a more efficient government with less political gridlock. Unionization yeah, works right. in the exact same manner. Please allow me to finish. What you realize here 
is that when you talk about how unions work, you realize that less sometimes is more, especially in the case of passing policy, when there are less actors often and one cohesive group that represents the majority, you're going to see more of an impact. You're going to see materialized change. And that's the only thing that's going to matter in this round, the impacts, because my opponents can't tangibly provide any solvency or any terminal impact. Whereas we tell you specifically that the impact of our case is more people being represented. At the end of the day, something is better than nothing when it comes to the policy making process, especially as it concerns unions. At least in our world, we show that through one cohesive union, more likely than not, uh, leg legislation, not even legislation, but rules and changes to the end, rules and changes to working policy is going to happen. In their world, more voices end up getting excluded under their arguments and get excluded from converging precedents. I'll take your POI. Yeah, so can you provide any warrant statistic or any evidence saying that the United States is an efficient government or is more efficient than the British government? I'm not citing the British government. I'm citing a parliamentary system in general. And I'm specifically saying that in a parliamentary system, there are more people and more parties that ultimately lead to a higher conflict of interest. And I'm not just talking about the United Kingdom. I'm talking about every single parliamentary government out there. At the end of the day, what you have to realize here is that when you're not like, you have to take the the, the reference or the illusion or the analogy for what it's worth. What we're telling you is that more voices leads to more muddling and more interest in the policy making process, which ultimately leads to more structural inefficiencies. Whereas in a world with less voices in a single unified voice that speaks for a majority of people, you're going to see more efficient legislation pass because in unions, there's going to be only two actors, the majority party, as well as the business that's uncontested. And it goes cold conceded throughout both of my opponent's speeches. You can completely drop them bargaining power at the end of the day is what like it's the real key here because you can't get anything done without that what they're advocating for is a fantasy in which companies are little in little nice workplaces in which they'll gladly listen to their employees if they get a boo boo but no companies are cutthroat and they want to maximize efficiency and this is what my opponents clearly misrepresent they're literally living in a hypothetical world what you have to realize is that in order for people to be represented you need numbers you need leverage having a single person or even a small group of people people won't do anything. More bargaining agents is going to be inevitable. My opponents drop that. Don't let them respond to that in their next speech as they had multiple chances to respond to it. Given Krishna's first speech, the warrant is clear. At the end of the day, once they concede that link, their entire case can just go completely dropped because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing to realize here. Because when you don't have bargaining power, you can't like get any rights if you don't have any bargaining power and the conflict of interest is what's going to drive down productivity at the end of the day you're going to extend our case because we tell you specifically that in our counter plan if a union ex that in the AF world, repealing exclusive representation would make it so that multiple unions carry the same weight, even though a majority exists under one specific union. And as such, more gridlock is going to ensue. It's going to lead to less adjustments passed for each worker. And that at the end of the day is inherently bad. In our world, you're seeing at least some tangible impact, some tangible change to people's working rights. In my opponent's world, you're literally seeing Jack. Thank you, and I urge a strong opposition. All right, is everyone ready? Um, so it's just going to go away at the top, then voting issues. Is everyone good? Cool. My time will start now. Judge, they consider the prerequisites in the member of government refutal speech. That means the first place you look to when evaluating this round will always be our first contention on bargaining power. The prerequisite that goes cold dropped is that you can't get done anything done without bargaining power. They're advocating for fantasy in which companies are nice little workplaces in which they're glad to listen to their employees if they ever get unhappy. But no, companies are cutthroat and they want to maximize efficiency and force their employees to live down on subpar wages and survive on food stamps. The only way to force these horrid companies' hand is with bargaining company bargaining power. It's why Amazon doesn't want to unionize their forces right now. It's why Google doesn't want their force to be unionized. It's why every single sweatshop in the entire world doesn't want unions to be a thing because of the bargaining power that has that. But if you affirm the resolution, you strip unions of all their bargaining power. Because even if you buy the fact that, hey, individuals can go bargain with a company, 
groups of individuals can go bargain with the company. Other unions can go bargain with the company. The fact of the matter is, is that this fragmenting system means it's not a, it's, it's not a one or done deal. It's not either A, all the workers will go on strike, or B, none of the workers will go on strike. It's, it's more like 5% of the workers will go on strike if you don't listen to these wage increases. That's really problematic because what company is going to listen to a $10 increase in hourly wages if just 1% of your workforce just goes on strike? That in itself is a logical contradiction that my opponent fails to comprehend. That in order to win all of their points at the end of the day, to grant minority rights, to grant any sort of increase in workers' rights and representation, they have to win the fact that bargaining power exists. But insofar as we proved with time and time, time and uh, time throughout this round that you completely strip unions of their bargaining power, that means you drop the, my opponent's contentions at face value. But then, even if you ignore anything I just said in the last two minutes, it's game over when you set net benefits as the weighing mechanism for the impacts of this round. That's because net benefits is literally utilitarianism. You're maximizing the most benefits for the most amount of people. That is literally what we're advocating and what the opposition is defending in the status quo. We're advocating for that the majority of people gets represented and the majority of people gets what they want. That only happens in the op world. In the gov world, you're restricting all of that. That means they're never going to get the majority of people getting the majority of benefits and they're wrong. And insofar as that's true, that literally goes against the way mechanism and the way that they told you to view this round. They can change it. Don't let them make any new responses about the prerequisite or about this weight mechanism in the next speech as in the last speech, and that's super abusive. But then let's go on to our contentions really, really quickly. We, we have three like untouched links that go conceded. Our first link is through converging presence. We tell you if one individual wants to bargain for a really, really low wage, whereas the majority of individuals want a really, really high wage, that means overall the company is always going to set the presence of the lower wage. That's literally what that's literally what companies do right now. Companies without unions do right now, in which they just look to which worker wants the lowest wage and, and they cross by that to every single worker. That's really bad because that means you only have company modes in which they're, they're, they have really low wages and that sets wages for everyone else. That's really why unions need to exist because we are trying to help the majority of people here. We're trying to help the people that aren't dogs for their companies. But the second way and the biggest way that ends them around is through bargain power. We tell you, without ex exclusive representation or an election, each employee designates a union of his or her own choice. That means either you have multiple bargaining powers or one bargaining power in our world. But this one bargaining power makes a clear blight line. If they, a, if they don't give them the demands, the entire workforce will be halted. B, if they do give them the demands, they will continue to work. But in their world, if you don't know how, how much these bargaining rights that these workers will have to negotiate, and that ends the round for them, because at the end of the day, workers' rights is only done through with bargaining power. And that's what you're voting for us. Thank you. All right, um, is anybody not ready? Okay, so then a brief off-time roadmap before my five-minute speech. I'm just gonna go over three main voting issues as to why you wanna vote Gov today, and then just uh, any remaining time, just some world versus worldview comparison. And with that, my time will start um, now. My partner and I are still proud to affirm today's resolution. With that, let's go into our first main voting issue and thing to review, that will be framework. So once again, we need to establish that the net benefits is not utilitarianism. They bring up these arguments that they're functionally the same thing, however, they're not. Net benefit is not like, it's not um, the benefit for the majority of people. It's still trying to find the most benefit possible, the world in which there is a greater amount of benefit, a greater amount of good. Utilitarianism is, let's look at the majority of people and help only those people, completely ignoring everyone else. They're functionally not the same thing because utilitarianism only focuses on the majority, while net benefit takes a holistic approach looking at people. But it is the negation world that first says utilitarianism is bad. They try to argue that, but it is also the world in which you function off a utilitarian principle, as we described to you, in our contention 1A. So if they think utilitarianism is bad and they argue that in their last two speeches, we'll understand that their world is also a world that functions off a utilitarian principle. So therefore, they're basically arguing that their own thing is bad. So under, once again, under framework, understand net benefit and utilitarianism utilitarianism are not functionally the same thing. Additionally, under the definition of exclusive representation, I'll read it word for word, read word for word, 
for you guys again. It is the right of a union by a majority of employees in a plant, craft, industry, etc., to represent all employees in the union, regardless of whether or not they are members of the union or not. So once again, that is representation for every single employee, whether or not they make these claims that like you can still sue, that you can still advocate. That is not true because you are not re representing yourself and you are not allowed to represent yourself legal on a legal basis. You cannot represent yourself if you are if if you disagree with what the exclusive representation like calls for. So don't buy any of their arguments that you can still sue even if you're not a member of the union. Like that's simply not true and they concede it to our definition and framing that that is not how it functions in the status quo, the status quo that they defend. Let's go to our second voting issue and that is the issue of representation. So once again, in our 1A, we described to you the utilitarian principle that this like this act in the negation world goes off of. And then in our 1B, we talk about to you how there's a lack of options for individuals in workplaces under the negation world. However, and their 1A, they basically give you this idea of converging presence, that this 99 to 1% uh, situation is going to cause us to have a breakdown of all union, like all processes, all negotiations, that if only, if, even if 1% of people oppose, we'll never have any progress. Don't buy that. We're still going to see companies like working for the best options to them. And they really try to paint it in like a black and white world. And that's simply not how the world functions itself. But we tell you once again, in the affirmation world, there is more of an option to representation. We're not saying it's a perfect be all fix all solution. We never say it is. My partner even goes on to agree that it's not going to fix every single problem in the status quo, but it's a step forward to doing that. Well, the negation has no change, but that brings us to our third voting issue, the idea of progress. So once again, in our contention to, we tell you as described by the UPenn Law Review, there is no progress in the negation world when this law has not been repealed because simply uh, these unions, these representatives just appease the majority. They do the basic appeasement that they need to have done and they don't actually listen to what really needs to be done. That's why in Amazon factories, people have to, they can't have good bathroom breaks. They have 12 hour shifts. That is the negation world. And the negation has the burden to bear all of the negatives of the world because they never propose a counter plan. They try to tell you in their um, 2NC that they're going to bring progress and they're going to change the world for a little bit better. They bring zero change. They are the status quo. So if you think the status quo is bad, don't fall for the negation because that's what they are. They're defending the status quo. And they try to paint the world in a black and white scenario. But that's not how it works. Once again, in their 1A, which they try to hinge their entire voting off of, they tell you with this 99 to 1% analogy, and they give you this, you know, they give you the story where it's the 1%, when the 1% minority prevents everyone from having any benefit, that is not how the world works. And we all know that. Do not buy that analogy. Once again, in reality, it's more like minorities consist of 20% of employees, 30% of employees, 40% of employees. Don't buy their analysis when it completely misconstrues how the world works. But let's go into just some world by world view analysis. So judges, I ask you to put yourself in that of a position of an employee not belonging to a union right now. Under the negation world, if you need a shorter shift, too bad. If you need to use a bat, if you need more bathroom breaks, too bad. If you think you deserve a higher wage, too bad. If you want to sue your employee, you sue your employer, too bad for you. It is the negation that even concedes this will happen when in their 2NC, their 2NC, they say that minorities are harmed in the negation world. But put yourself of that in the affirmation world. We tell you that unions will still have their power. So you can still strike with your union. You can still act with your union. But it also gives people that aren't in unions the option to do the same things. So in the affirmation world, if you want a shorter shift, you have the ability to ask for that. If you need more bathroom breaks, you have the ability to ask for that. If you think you deserve a higher wage, you have the ability to ask for that. If you want to sue, you can do that. It is the affirmation world that gives more options to the people and promotes progress. Thus, you affirm. Thank you. Good round, guys. Great round, everyone. whatever works for you sure uh, I chose that uh, Neg won this debate um, and I chose it because uh, for me the basic uh, basics of this debate comes down to the history of the labor movement the history of, of what this uh, resolution is is about and that has to do with the fundamentals of of what is the nature of collective bargaining and why we have it the issue in in this particular resolution as far as i'm concerned 
is why do we have exclusivity as a, a fundamental aspect of, of the current labor status and what do we gain and or lose by changing this policy and the debate that flows there uh, from. And I think that, that that's an issue of collective bargaining. It's an issue of, of uh, the power of the collective bargaining to go up against corporations. And I found it uh, relatively distressing that there were lots of examples of, of Amazon and fulfillment warehousing being thrown around. In uh, fact, these are un-unionized uh, uh, examples, and specifically they're ununionized in uh, one of the most exploitive uh, aspects of the current American uh, disposable labor market, and that was completely uh, unaddressed by, by really both AF and A, and that's a, a, one of the reasons I think that this resolution was put in there. And so the status quo as the fallback position uh, was the nature of, of the win from my standpoint. Uh, I do hope I do hope that my RFD was not a, a comment about the nature and or level of the, the debate because it was not supposed to be. I thought the debate was excellent. I've been judging debate specifically uh, Parley and, and uh, LD for four years now, and this is very high level of debate, and I was really pleased to participate. So that was not in any way uh, supposed to be uh, the statement of the nature and or level of the debate. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank, thank you all. It's been great debate, guys. Yeah, thank you, everybody.